The name Cobra, where does it actually come from? Um, after the Second World War, there was a group of artists, poets, painters, who actually got fed up with tradition. Uh, and they got inspired by African art and by children's drawings. You know, really uncomplicated, out of their fantasy, without any preconceived plan, whatever. Um, and uh, these artists, they came from Copenhagen, Brussels and Amsterdam. That's actually the origin of the name Cobra. And the only thing traditional about this group of artists was the materials they used. They used oil, acrylic did not yet exist. They used gouache color, just like every other painter before. But the style they painted in, this was something really new that turned upside down the world of art. And this is also what Cobra is. It's oil, it's pure oil. This is the traditional side, but really it's water mixable, so it turns the world of oil color upside down. And since I have this tube in my hand anyway, um, I think it might be interesting to explain something about uh, the communication on the tube. There are different symbols on the tube uh, concerning special uh, properties of paint. And um, what is paint? To understand those symbols, we have to understand paint. To make paint, first of all, we need something that gives color to the paint. In general, we call this coloring agents. And coloring agents are dry powders. With dry powders, you cannot paint, so you need something else to mix those coloring agents with, and that's the binder of the paint. Can be oil, can be a solution of gum arabic for watercolor, or an acrylic resin dispersion for the cobra, it's linseed oil. And first, let's get in to the coloring agents. I got several coloring agents here, and this is a dark red one, for example. It's dry powder. And here we got two jars of water. Now let's pretend that the water is a binder. In reality, it's not. It's a solvent. It evaporates completely out of your paint. The meaning of a binder, actually, is that after drying, the binder will form a film in which the coloring agent is protected and the binder takes care of the adherence to the substrate. But for what I want to show you now, it's easier to use water. So theoretically, we're going to make some paint. And when I put a little bit of this coloring agent into my binder, so to speak, then let's see what happens. It's beautiful. And actually, I don't have to do anything. My coloring agent is dividing itself into my paint all by itself. When we help it a little bit, then my paint now is completely red. And the color, the powder I put in, has completely disappeared. Not really, but it has dissolved, like sugar in the tea. If a coloring agent behaves like that, we call it a dye. Now, I got some other coloring agents here. And when I put this in this jar, look what happens. It sinks, sets itself to the bottom of the jar, but it does not dissolve. I got another one here. This one floats. It's a very light one. The other one is heavy, but it does not dissolve. If a coloring agent behaves like this in a binder, we call it a pigment. Now, it would be very easy to use a dye in paint because, you know, you just take some dye, a binder, you stir a couple of times and your paint has a color. Uh, but still, we never do that. We never use dyes to make artist materials, artist paints. We only use pigments because there's another different difference between the two. And this difference concerns light fastness, which is really important, of course, if the color remains the same in time, attacked by the light and especially the UV part of light, uh, which also has uh, consequences for the uh, production of paint uh, to have these pigments equally dispersed 
in the binder. And uh, we're going to explain a little bit more about that, so we understand also quality of paint. Now the light fastness uh, of colors differs from color to color, actually. And uh, the light fastness of colors is measured in a scientific way. Uh, for uh, measuring light fastness, you need a standardized uh, light concentration, and actually it's done uh, under circumstances equal to uh, the light circumstances in the National Gallery uh, in London. Um, you know, a museum where very valuable pieces of art are exposed. If you want to know more about how it's exactly uh, measured, please visit our website uh, royaltalents.com. There's a chapter, it's uh, technical and you find a whole lot of information there. So these colors we see here, uh, for example, they have been partly covered up with pieces of black paper, so those parts are not exposed to the light, and the parts that are exposed to the light, um, in total, they have been exposed for one century to museum circumstances. And then, after one century, which we do in about three weeks in special light chambers, we take off the pieces of black paper and you see that some colors have faded completely and others have not. So, you would not like to have this one in your painting, would you? We better use colors like this. Now, when we draw an eight-step light fastness scale, so this is one, very poor light fast, eight, completely light fast, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we look at the light fastness of dyes and pigments, then the light fastness of dyes is never higher than six on this scale. And in this area, it's just a few. Most dyes are in this area. Pigments, we find, from very poor till excellent. Some pigments actually are completely 100% light fast. They will never change, as far as we know. On the packaging of all Royal Talents products, we find symbols for light fastness. And actually, we have four possibilities. We have a zero, one plus, two pluses and three pluses. And on the eight step scale, I'm talking about these areas. Three pluses is from seven till eight, two pluses six till seven, one plus five till six, and a zero, everything lower than five. Well, a zero hardly exists in the Royal Talents products. It's only the reflex colors because light fast reflex pigments do not exist. A color with a zero, will have faded after being exposed to those museum circumstances in between 0 and 10 years. 1 plus in between 10 years and 25 years. 3 pluses 25 till a century. And 3 pluses, they start maybe after a century to uh, show some changes and they can be eternal light fast in between hundred and eternity. Um, for the Cobra paints, whether it's artist or study, we only have three pluses. This is modern times, man. Rembrandt would really like to have pigments like this. He didn't, we have. Uh, another symbol on the packaging concerns the covering power of the paints. Um, with Royal Talents products, you will find four possible symbols for the covering power. There is an open square. There is a square with a diagonal. There is a square, it's half black, half white, and there's one completely black. Now, I often get the question, what's the difference between half empty and half full? But it's not like that. This symbol is for the most transparent pigments. This one is for the most opaque pigments. And what we actually do, I draw a scale again, um, we apply paint on pieces of paper that are half black, half white. And as you see with, for example, this yellow one, 
the black and white separation really shows through the paint. With this white one, it doesn't at all. And the paint layer here, the white one and the yellow one, the thickness of the paint layer is exactly the same. So what we do afterwards, with the machine we measure light reflection here and light reflection here. Here there's a huge difference. With that white one, where is it? Oh, a blue one, doesn't matter. You don't see the separation. Light reflection here and light reflection here is exactly the same. So the difference in light reflection we put on this scale and every outcome in this area we call transparent. Every outcome in this area we call opaque and the big part in the middle we have divided into semi-transparent and semi-opaque. So these are indications for the painter depending whether you want to paint uh, opaque layers or the, whether you want to make glazings for example, then you need transparent pigments. Uh, it's indications because if we measure a color here it will have this symbol. If we measure a color here, it will have that symbol, but in reality they're very close. You as a painter will not notice a lot of difference, but then again, you do not paint in layers exactly uh, with 100 microns thickness as it is here, no. You just look and you say it should be a little bit more transparent or a little bit more opaque, you apply the paint thinner or a little bit thicker. So these symbols are just indications. The symbols for light fastness and uh, covering power, you'll find them next to the color number on top of the tube. Other interesting information we find on back of the tube, where we find the pigment that is used, the type of pigment used for this color. And the pigment indication on our packaging is uh, indication according to the color index. The color index uh, is a row of books in which every known pigment is fully described. Pages on one pigment. Sometimes pigments have names, scientific names that you cannot pronounce, you know. They're, sometimes they're as long as, as, as one sentence. So in the color index they use very simple pigment names. Uh, it's a system in English and it starts with the P of pigment and then we have uh, a letter of the color group. So this is the group of whites. Then we have the group of yellows, we have the group of oranges, we have the group of reds, we have the group of violets, the blues, the greens, the browns and the blacks. And then we will find a number. For example, PW4 is zinc white, PW6 is titanium white, PB29 is ultramarine, etc. So why is this interesting? Uh, suppose you have a favorite color you use always, let's say sky blue. Now what is sky blue? Which sky? In the morning, in the evening? It's a traditional name but it's also a fantasy name. Uh, and you go to the shop and the, the sky blue of your, the brand that you're using normally is not there. Sold out. So the guy in the shop says here man, I got another one from Royal Talons, very good paint, and it's also sky blue. And then you come home and you notice that mixing with that sky blue is completely different than mixing with the color that you're used to. Because this sky blue might have been produced with a completely different blue pigment. Like I said, what is sky blue? So you better look at the pigment used in a certain color then it does not mean that the color is 100% the same, but at least the mixing abilities are very similar. Okay guys, that's it for today. Uh, hope to see you next time. Uh, and then we have a closer look to the production process of paint in general. See you next time, bye bye.